Now it's time for uh, today's perspective on the programme. And if you think of uh, spy agencies, you probably think of uh, the CIA, MI5, perhaps the KGB. The three spy organisations often immortalised, of course, in many a spy thriller. Their operatives often ruthless, carrying out their work with rather a disregard for any kind of trial or assessment of the real truth before foes are done away with. Is that a real world, though? Well, certainly many aspects of that apply to Israel's secret agency, Mossad. If the writer of uh, this book is to be believed, Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. It's been published in English uh, for at least a year or so, but it's published here in France today in French as well, and it's author Ronan Bergman. Staff writer for the New York Times magazine, it's based in Tel Aviv. He's also a member of the Israeli Bar. Thanks very much for coming in Hi. and talking to us today. I mean, there's some pretty tough accusations, aren't there, in the book about... Uh, Mossad. You talk, yes, about its successes, also about its crimes, saying innocent people have died, killing a man no longer required the Prime Minister's approval, saying prisoners complained in court that they confessed only after being tortured. I mean, it is a, a tough image, isn't it? Well, I think that the, the uh, picture described in the book is quite uh, complex. On one hand, as you say, there are cases when um, Mossad failed, and sometimes the Jewish or Israeli James Bond looks more like Inspector Clouseau. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are moral deliberations. Um, the whole use of targeted assassination or, 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 or targeted killing, as they call it in America, is under a constant legal and moral debate. But at the end of the day, it seems that the lesson I did eight years of research, I interviewed 1,000 people trying to get a real understanding of the history, the secret history of Israel's um, uh, intelligence because that history has such a profound impact on the history of the country and the history of the Middle East. I think you cannot have a, a, a correct and true reading into the history of Israel without knowing the secret history of its intelligence services. And after all these eight years, I can tell you that there were cases where the use of targeted killing was the only thing that brought ceasefire. Uh, in 2000, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad launched a horrific wave of suicide killing, suicide uh, bombing into Israel. And the only thing that stopped them from coming mm. was when Israel started to target their commanders. So Does it justify, though, because surely there's a very, very thin red line and the red line needs to be put somewhere and surely that should you know, be done in courts and, and that kind of thing, rather than people just yeah. going out and deliberately now, targeting of, of, people? Of course, that should have been done in court. But if you have someone like um, al-Baghdadi, who was taken out by the U.S., a more famous case, or El -Suleimani, uh, General Suleimani, who was just taken out today, these people are, you know, um, uh, responsible for the death of thousands of people. Someone Would someone say that if his country or if his authority, theoretically, has the option to kill al-Baghdadi, would he say no? Would she say no? It's, it's a tough choice. It's a, it's a diabolic dilemma. And the chief, the former chief of Mossad, Tamir Pardo, says in one of the interviews he gave, I said I did 1,000 interviews, one of the interviews said, look, this is the deliberation. This is the dilemma that we have been facing every day in our career in the Mossad. What sort of weapons, what sort of tools do you use uh, in order to defend Israel and Israel's national security and Israeli and Jews all over the world, while you know that some of these tools, you know, are in contradiction to other values of democracy. I mean, at least people, from what you're saying there, realise there's a dilemma in the first place yeah. and realise that there has to be some kind of limit, perhaps. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's uh, in, in terms of, uh, sorry, cost of blood, uh, it's uh, by far, uh, it, it costs less to go to and use high target, uh, uh, targeted killings or, or um, uh, operations way beyond enemy lines than go to an all-out war. I think it's not a coincidence that the president that authorized, the US president, that authorized the biggest number of targeted killings ever in history was the liberal left-wing Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And Israel, I think, they, throughout the years, uh, proved that it's, it, it is trying to confront some of these dilemmas. And some of them, I think, and it's highly, you know, I think it's described in the book. This is not a book just glorifying the Mossad. This is a book bringing the history from the mouth and the documents of the people who actually uh, actually did that. But yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's a highly secreted organisation as well. How on earth did you get some of these people um, to speak to you about it? He smiled. <laughs> that was uh, enough, was it? No, it was not enough. But I think yeah. that after so many years in the 
twilight zone of secrecy, in the, in the realm of darkness, of espionage. People really wanted to get the stories out. People told me, I'm saying to you things that I never told my wife, because they wanted people to know what they have done in order to keep Israel safe. And you know, if one of them was not that enthusiastic to talk, I did to him or her the one thing that makes Israelis more furious and ballistic than anything else. I told him that someone else took credit for his operation. <laughs> that usually <laughs> solved the up. problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I notice you're talking in the past tense. I mean, it, presumably this is still going on. Yeah, yeah it's still going on. We, um, you know, Israel is using that weapon quite frequently. Israel is trying to, this is the, the perception that was adopted, the strategy that was uh, established by David Ben-Gurion, the Israeli first prime minister, the establisher of the state. I think he was the, 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 the most important Jew, maybe except for Moses, in our history. He said Israel cannot sustain long-term war. In order to do that, it needs to be based on mobilizing reserve duties. In order to do that, it needs to have very strong intelligence services. But the intelligence services in Israel not just collect intelligence, like most services in the world. It translates the intelligence into pinpoint operations way beyond enemy lines with the main goal to prolong the gaps between the war, if not, con if the, if not prevent them completely. So better to... Uh, you know, assassinate a, 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 an Iranian nuclear scientist and try to hold or delay the nuclear project of Iran than to go to an all-out war against Iran, something that, you know, you, you know where you start, you don't know where it's at, and will cost by far, by far more, 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 more lives. Now, I don't know, I know, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying, trying to explain through this book, without judgment, just saying this is the Israeli mindset this is the way that Israeli decision-making process works. Sometimes it works very well, sometimes not. In any case, it's highly, highly affected by the past. The past is the Holocaust. You're quite defensive as well, though, aren't you, of, of, of the people who work for Mossad? I mean, from what you're defensive. saying as well, believing, they believe very much that they're doing what's right for their country. Yeah, I think that what they, it's, it's you know, many of the interviewees, uh, who, of course, are not coordinated with one another, Recall that phrase from the Babylonian Talmud. Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. The use of that was not in order to impress me and the readers of the book with their knowledge of uh, Jewish uh, scripture. They wanted to explain their mindset. And their mindset is that a country that was born out of the ashes of the Holocaust with the belief Again, not, not, not passing historical judgment, but with the belief that there is always be someone who is after us to kill us to perform, to perform a second annihilation. A country that faces each generation, each decade, faces a prime nemesis that calls for its destruction very publicly. You know, even today, Hamas does not accept Israel as, a, as, as, as something, uh, 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 as a proof or as, as a fact in the Middle East. A country of that will pay less attribution to diplomacy or an international law and more to the need to survive, as Ehud Barak once said, a villa in the jungle. And the need to survive is rise and kill first. Good to have you with us on the programme, Ronan Bergman, that book coming out uh, here in France today. As I say, you can also uh, find it in English as well. Thanks very much. Thank for you. Have a good morning. And talking to us here on France 24.